When Buck Hammer and his family lived in a modest clapboard house about two miles from the small East Texas town of Big Sandy, he could walk into his backyard, gaze beyond the rabbit hutch located there, and view a good portion of his property. But that was 40 years ago. Follow that same gaze now, and you would see the grounds of Ambassador College. What was once the Hammer's driveway has become an entrance road to a 2,500-acre college complex, and the dirt roads have been transformed into paved streets. Also within the view would be the Ambassador College Fieldhouse, where church services are held weekly for the 2,250-plus members of the Worldwide Church of God of Big Sandy and their families. They share in the realization of a dream first held by the college and church's founder, Herbert W. Armstrong. This history of the Big Sandy Church charts the growth of that vision, from its bold beginnings four decades ago to its aspirations for the 90s and beyond. Greetings, friends. The real significance behind today's world disturbances is simply this, that we're now near world peace, believe it or not. The vision began to unfold in 1948 when a relationship was forged between Herbert W. Armstrong and an East Texas family. Listeners of Mr. Armstrong's World Tomorrow radio broadcast, Roy Hammer, his wife Pearl, and his son and daughter-in-law, Buck and Jean Hammer, visited the church's headquarters in Pasadena, California. In 1951, Roy Hammer invited 13 other members of the church into his home for Passover services. The next spring, the church again met for the Passover in the Hammer home in Gladewater, Texas. This time, 89 members some from hundreds of miles away, crammed into the small house. It was during the Passover season in 1952 that uh, so many people came to Passover here that Mr. Armstrong decided that uh, we should have a local church in East Texas. He commissioned uh, my father and I to find a suitable place for a local church. After uh, searching out several and then taking 
Mr. Herbert Armstrong and Garner Ted Armstrong to visit these places. Uh, we didn't really have one that suited him. So I told him that I had some land that I would donate him. And so he came out to look at the present property and he liked the rolling hills. And so at that time, uh, the decision was made that uh, we would build the local church where the present Redwood building is. So the church has grown through the years to be quite a church and also it's in, included as in one great college. In Mr. Armstrong's eyes, the area was perfect for a church meeting site. So the next year, 1953, marked both the beginning of regular services for the Big Sandy congregation and the groundbreaking for the Redwood Building, designed to house church services and the Feast of Tabernacles. In the very early days of this uh, start out to build this, uh, much clearing was done over on the hill where the Redwood Building is. And there was many sand burrs and bull nettles dug and cleared. I spent a good time uh, bulldozing a section of trees where the new uh, women's uh, dormitories are now that was made into a camp area at that time. He and his father, Roy, spent much of that year laboring on the Quonset-shaped structure, and by fall it was ready to serve as the sole feast site for the United States. It was cold and there had not been time to install windows. More than 700 brethren shivered there together that fall. Over the years, the Redwood Building continued to be a focus of Big Sandy Church activities. In 1954, it served as classroom facilities for the newly established Imperial Grade and High Schools. Imperial classes were held there until the Imperial School Complex was built in 1964. After Marjorie and I were married, we were sent to our first pastorate, the Gladewater Radio Church of God, as it was known then. It was a number of years later that it began to be called the Big Sandy Worldwide Church of God. I had quite a shock when we arrived in Gladewater. Mr. Raymond Cole broke me in quickly by assigning me to conduct the church Bible study and give the sermon on the first Sabbath after we arrived. He visited one member with me and then I was on my own, fresh out of college and green as grass. I taught in Imperial School under Mr. Floyd Lochner for part of each school day and worked as pastor of the church the rest of the day. After the Feast of Tabernacles 1955, Mr. Cole was transferred, leaving me to pastor the church, and yet I was not ordained. There was a lot of fasting and praying for the income of the work of God at that time. There just was not enough money to go around, so everyone had to wait and wait to be paid his salary. We bought groceries on credit and went to Mr. Buck Hammer's gas pump to fill our car with gas. Buck and Jean were very dedicated servants, and without being able to obtain gas at his pump, we would not have been able to visit members. We know we were blessed and honored by God when he sent us to Gladewater for our first pastorate in the ministry. The Redwood Tabernacle was the home for the first imperial school, but this was only the beginning of firsts. Mr. Dick Armstrong has started a spokesman club for men in the Pasadena congregation. During the feast in 1957, Dick asked if I had considered having one in Big Sandy. December 1957 was the first field spokesman club. We were on the grow. A larger building was needed to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Construction began in early 1958 on a gleaming metal building now known as the Field House. To our surprise, we outgrew this building the first year, but we were prepared. The end of the building could be unbolted and expanded to any length. In 1959, the west end was reattached. The square foot capacity was increased by one-third. With the Feast of Tabernacles now being held in the field house, 
The outgrown Redwood building was used as a dining hall. Also that year, 300 booths were built on the church grounds to house feast goers. In the early 60s, the idea came to us to have a summer camp for the youth in the local church. We purchased tents and supplies in an army surplus store. A new member of the congregation, Dr. W.E. Parrish, had considerable experience working with the Boy Scouts of America. A program was developed and the experience was so rewarding for the local youth that we soon considered ways to expand beyond the local area. Two years later was the first SEP in Big Sandy, as was the case of the Feast of Tabernacles and Spokesman Club, SEP was to become international. Roy Hammer died in 1962, and Mr. Armstrong announced that when the Redwood Building was remodeled, it would be renamed in his honor. In September 1969, in recognition of Mr. Hammer's labor, the structure was rededicated as the Roy Hammer Library, with an engraved plaque being placed on the exterior and a portrait of the building's namesake hung inside. After the death of his father, Buck Hammer took over the responsibility of continuing to improve the church grounds. On an adjoining property he owned, with the help of volunteer labor from church members, he constructed a lake, which he named Lake Loma, after Mrs. Armstrong. That property Mr. Hammer soon deeded to the church as plans called for the establishment of a third Ambassador College in Texas, joining the original campus in Pasadena, California, and a sister campus in Brickett Wood, England. Back in the latter part of uh, 1962, there was uh, speculation about building a college here in East Texas because of the existing buildings we had. But when we went to uh, bankers to uh, get money to build the first homes and to build some classrooms, they thought we must be crazy to be we're going to start a college out there in this sand pile. But you can see how this sand pile has grown such a great institution. But in the fall of 1964, a pioneering group of 40 Pasadena transfer students and 65 freshmen arrived on the rough-hewn campus to take residence in the feast booths, now called Booth City. Leroy Neff was named acting deputy chancellor to open the first year until Les McCullough was named deputy chancellor in the spring. Mr. Armstrong set in motion the ambassador motto, Recapture True Values, at the inception of the Big Sandy campus, beginning a new era in the Big Sandy church. The church, as well as the college, would benefit from the building programs he oversaw and his insistence on high standards. In 1965, construction on the college dormitories and the church's mailing department began, and the campus produced seven graduates. This was also the last year that the Feast of Tabernacles was kept in the field house until 1992. Reflecting back on the Big Sandy Church it is done with a certain degree of amazement with Marion and me. We never thought of it as having hard times in the times gone by, and yet they were there. The starkness and the chill of the tabernacle building, as it was called, with its concrete floors, no heat, faulty septic system, that's all a part of it. It's hard when sitting in an air-conditioned uh, splendor to remember the times when it was barely freezing in the building during Bible studies and the people were bundled up in blankets with the children on the floor wrapped tightly against the cold. Those things become good memories 30 years later. The old days are time which in retrospect bring mainly good memories. As I look back, those were some of the happiest years of my life. Big Sandy is home. In 1966, Lake Loma, 
in constant use by the college and the church for recreational purposes, was doubled in size, and 12,000 brethren met under the big top in a gigantic tent for the feast. The majority of those meeting for the fall festival camped out in the wooded area nearby known as the Piney Woods Campground and in an auxiliary campground across Lake Loma. By 1968, work was completed on a 96,000 square feet metal convention center and accompanying festival administration building built to accommodate crowds of up to 16,000 feast goers. Also during this time, the Spanish editions of the church's publications, The Plain Truth and Tomorrow's World were printed in Big Sandy. In April of 1973, the church's internationally circulated newspaper, The Worldwide News, was first produced in Big Sandy. It was printed here until the summer of 1977 when its operations were moved to Pasadena. During this time, church members volunteered on a regular basis to help label, sort, and prepare for mail-outs up to 32,000 worldwide news issues at a time. In 1975, a pioneering version of the Youth Educational Services was begun in Big Sandy to serve youths in kindergarten through sixth grades with educational and social opportunities. Iris and I were transferred to Big Sandy in June of 1975. Soon we began a senior citizens club to accommodate the many seniors who had moved to the Big Sandy Church area over the years. They chose to name themselves the Silver Ambassadors. Dr. Galloway was the first president and his wife was the first secretary treasurer. These seniors were an encouraging and supportive element to Mr. Pyle and me. In 1976, the field house was remodeled, enhancing its usefulness to both the college and the church. Also that year, Big Sandy hosted the first national Youth Opportunities United Conference for church youths in 7th through 12th grades. In 1977, after conferring degrees to 111 students, the Big Sandy campus of Ambassador College was closed. While the college was merged with the final remaining campus in Pasadena, the church continued to use the campus facilities as a home base for local and regional church activities, including ministerial and youth conferences. Sports tournaments were also centered in Big Sandy, which served as the site for the 1978 Youth Opportunities United National Basketball Finals. In 1984, to augment the system in Pasadena, Watts lines were installed on the campus to help process literature requests from church advertising. Big Sandy church members became heavily involved in donating their time to the Watts services. Approximately 200 members in six crews handled 20 to 30,000 calls per weekend for four to five years and entered thousands of Plain Truth subscriber addresses. In all, church member volunteers helped take four and one-half million calls from March 1984 to December 1992. Church members still work for what became in 1990 the church's sole telephone response and mail processing center for the United States. In 1986, the church was saddened by the death of Herbert W. Armstrong, a man whose singular vision founded both the Worldwide Church of God and Ambassador College. Joseph W. Tkach became Pastor General of the church. In 1988, the Big Sandy Congregation celebrated its 35th anniversary along with pioneer members, ministers, and friends from across the nation. The event included a picnic and special services. On December 14, 1989, Church Pastor General Joseph W. Tkach made an announcement that would prove earth-shaking to the church and college in Big Sandy. Now why are we here today? Ambassador College is at a crossroads 
today due to the legal requirements governing higher education in both California and Texas. In order to grant degrees, we must receive state approval. Since the alternative of being only a Bible college does not conform to the historic mission of Ambassador College, the dividends of an ambassador education for the individual and the Church of God are too great to consider closing the colleges. However, we believe that our resources are stretched too thin to try to accredit two colleges. After much thought and prayers, the board of directors, of which I am the chairman, have found an alternative that appears to best deal with these new conditions and requirements. As a result of careful investigation, a great deal of thought and prayer, the board of directors have reached a resolution. As I speak, a statement to the press is being released that outlines the board resolution that was approved, and I would like to read that to you now. And here is the press release. College to consolidate four-year academic program in Texas. And I could hear them shouting in Big Sandy right now, yay for Texas. While church offices in Pasadena were to remain as international headquarters and the center for the Ambassador Foundation and Performing Arts Program, Big Sandy geared up for the massive move. That spring, while construction on the college campus was slowed by unseasonably heavy rains, church members who had already begun meeting in the convention center because of a renovation project in the field house gathered 1,589 strong for what may well have been the largest single Passover service in the history of the New Testament church. In June of 1990, the church resumed meeting in the field house. Its congregation of 1,300 members was reconfigured into two congregations. Through coordination carried out with smooth teamwork, scores of dedicated employees and volunteers worked tirelessly to meet the initial deadlines for consolidation and accreditation. Their efforts were shown fruitful when, on September 4th, the college began its 1990-1991 academic year with a student body of 1,160 students. Hundreds of Big Sandy church members had worked alongside hired contractors in what college president Donald Ward called a heartwarming example of dedication. He thanked the church for the members' sacrifice, loyalty, and patience in a celebration Sabbath, September 15th. It was an honor to serve as the inaugural pastor of the AM congregation. Even though we departed very quickly and served you a short time, we left behind many new friends and loved ones, and we feel very much a part of the fabric of the Big Sandy Church. Though the two congregations, now numbering about 1,200 members each, now meet at separate times and have different pastors, the church is still known simply as the Big Sandy Church. And though the church in Big Sandy is similar in many ways to any other local worldwide Church of God congregation, in other ways it is unique. Its uniqueness lies not only in its size, but in its large and constant influx of visitors due to the many activities offered and sponsored by the church and college, its designation as a festival site, its supplying of guest speakers to a dozen outlying church areas, and its recent appointment as a regional YOU hub. To coordinate its unique features and the more typical facets of church activities such as YOU, YES, and Silver Ambassador events, men's and youth clubs, and social happenings such as the Western or Spring Formal Dance and Church Picnic, the Big Sandy Church relies on the Big Sandy Church office. Vast numbers of volunteers serve in the Big Sandy congregations, and the church office staff tries, whenever possible, 
to rely on the expertise and talent of member volunteers. Volunteers routinely help plan and execute social and sporting events, maintain services such as the church's clothing exchange boutique, and coordinate region-wide activities such as the YOU Regional Arts Showcase held in Big Sandy for the past several years. As 1993 began, the congregation was focusing on a new clarity of vision emphasized by our Pastor General in his feast 1992 sermon. Verse 15. He says, neither do men light a lamp or a candle and put it under a bushel. And unconsciously, we have been guilty of doing just that. We assumed erroneously that by producing the World Tomorrow program and publishing the Plain Truth magazine, that we were letting our light shine to the extent that Christ was commanding us here. I believe the greatest witnessing is, that is going to take place is going to take place by each one of us individually in our own locale, in our own communities, wherever we're employed, whoever we come in contact with. I think this is what Jesus Christ is referring to when he says, you are the light of the world. We are to say, set an example of good conduct, good morals. We should be a walking, talking commercial and a living ad for the wonderful world tomorrow and the kingdom of God, which the Feast of Tabernacles reflects. Extending the beam of Christian service beyond the church door may be a shift in emphasis for the worldwide Church of God in general. But for the Big Sandy Church in particular, it is not altogether a foreign concept. Because of the large numbers of church members concentrated in Big Sandy and other nearby towns, such as Hawkins and Gladewater, the church has a long history of involvement in the greater community of which it is a part.
appropriate as a watchword for continued growth are these words from our Pastor General. Let's continue to grow together, letting the Bible be our guide, following in faith as God leads us into all truth through the Holy Spirit.